This is Lecture 3 in the series Introduction to Pro-Capitalist Macroeconomics. Uh, our subject for this morning is unemployment. And uh, everything I have to say about the subject I think can be subsumed under uh, six or seven shorter points than I have in the lecture supplement. Uh, the first being the principle, why is there unemployment? The second being, what are the precipitating causes of unemployment? The third, how unemployment can be eliminated? Uh, the fourth, what are the consequences of eliminating it from the point of view of the effect on uh, the standard of living of the average worker and the profitability of business. The fifth, what are the obstacles in the way, or let me, uh, the fifth should really be, what are the fundamental requirements of eliminating unemployment? What uh, basic institutional conditions must exist? And then uh, the sixth, what are the obstacles in the way of the elimination? What are the wrong institutions that we have that prevent unemployment from being eliminated? And sixth, I want to try to apply the principles I'm developing to the history of unemployment since uh, the Great Depression. And then finally, uh, I'll conclude on what I con would consider to be a rational uh, government policy consistent with the principles of economic freedom that would truly uh, prevent unemployment from being a problem. All right, well, we, on the basis of the first two lectures that I've given, I hope that I've established that our need and desire for wealth has no limit. So no lack of need or desire for labor or the products of labor can explain unemployment. I've uh, shown that there's an inherent, ineradicable scarcity of labor. And then I've also shown that the very process of production itself creates purchasing power. Production is uh, the necessary and sufficient cause of more aggregate, economy-wide, real demand. Well, it would seem that there is really no reason for unemployment to exist. And there is no metaphysical reason for unemployment to exist. Metaphysically, the opportunities for employment are unlimited, and all we have to do is go and produce. That's the basic metaphysical situation. The reason that unemployment exists is because of man-made institutional obstacles to employment. Now, uh, in terms of the, one of the formulas that I have on page one, two formulas actually, the one for wages and the one for prices, we have the average money wage. I think, can you all see this in the back? It's in, it's in the lecture supplement. To save myself some writing, I'd like to use some shorthand. Instead of writing out demand for labor or payrolls, I'd like to just say D sub L. And instead of number of workers employed, I'd just like to say S sub L, supply of labor, demand for labor, supply of labor. And similarly, the general consumer price level will express as the demand for consumer goods, D sub G, over the supply produced and sold, S sub G. So it's exactly the same formulas that you have on page one, and also I repeat them here on page 10. Now, let us just ponder uh, the truth of these formulas for a moment. What I'm saying is that the average wage earned in the economic system, the average wage for some definite period of time, let us say a year, the average annual wage per worker is equal to 
the number of workers employed divided into total payrolls. Let's suppose we had total payrolls of one million dollars in the economic system and we had 1,000 workers employed. Well, what would be the average annual wage? One thousand dollars. All right, and if there is so much spending to buy consumer goods and such and such quantity produced and sold, there is an average price at which the goods are sold. If I were to ask you, uh, think of the nearest Savon drugstore and tell me uh, how I would compute the average price at which a pack of cigarettes was sold in that drugstore last week. How would you go about computing the average price at which a pack of cigarettes was sold last week? Well, we take the total amount of money spent to buy cigarettes in that store and divide by the number of packs sold. It would be the spending divided by the quantity sold. And we would do the same thing for the number of pairs of shoes at the nearest Florsheim shoe store, etc. And if we want to calculate or express in some way the general consumer price level, we would take all of the spending to buy consumer goods and divide it by the totality of the consumer goods sold. And that would give us the general price level at which goods were actually sold. So, the average wage is equal to the number of workers employed divided into total payroll spending. The general price level is equal to the quantity of goods sold divided into total consumer spending. Now, uh, I know I've asked this question rhetorically to you in a previous lecture. How much is any given amount of spending, either for labor or for goods, capable of buying? It depends strictly on the wages and prices. A million dollars in payrolls will employ a thousand workers at an average annual wage of a thousand. How much will a million dollars in payrolls, how many workers will a million dollars in payrolls employ at an average annual wage of 500? 2,000. And on and on. So what determines the number of workers that any given volume of payrolls can employ the quantity of goods that any given amount of spending for goods can buy uh, are the wage and price level, respectively. And that cognition should enable us to understand why there is unemployment. And the basic answer, very simply put, is that uh, money wages are uh, too high relative to the volume of payrolls. Money wages are too high relative to the demand for labor, which indirectly means money wages are too high relative to the quantity of money in the economic system. Because what determines total payrolls, total spending to buy goods? What's the basic determinant of the volume of spending? The quantity of money. Well, the quantity of money uh, determines the total spending for consumer goods, the total spending for labor, it's the fundamental determinant of any economy-wide uh, aggregate. Well, unemployment and unsold goods, the inability to sell goods up to our capacity to produce, these are the result of wages and prices being excessive relative to the quantity of money and volume of spending in the economic system. Unemployment and unsold goods exist really for just one reason. Wages and prices are excessive relative to the quantity of money and volume of spending for goods and labor respectively. That's the only reason that unemployment exists. If wages and prices were lower relative to the spending for goods and labor and the underlying quantity of money, we would have full employment. We could easily have a labor and goods shortage. Suppose that the total payroll spending is a million. There are a thousand workers who'd like to work. We have a thousand workers able and willing to work. 
the quantity of money in the economic system will support payrolls of one million dollars. Well, a wage of one thousand dollars per worker, an average wage of one thousand dollars per worker, will equalize the number of jobs available with the number of workers seeking jobs. And then we'll have full employment. What if the average wage per worker fell below $1,000? Suppose it were $900. Employers have the capacity and the willingness to expend a million dollars in payrolls. There are only 1,000 workers seeking work. How many jobs would be offered? About 1,100. 900 per person into a million yields uh, something over 1,100, I believe. Well, we would then have 1,100 jobs for only 1,000 workers. There'd be an actual labor shortage. Conversely, if the average wage is held at 1,100 rather than 1,000, well then, we have 1,000 workers seeking work, but there are only 900 jobs available. The whole issue of unemployment, it, it can't be stressed too heavily, is strictly a question of the relationship between wages, money wages, and you, you'll see why I use the term money wages. Uh, it, this does not mean the same thing as the worker's standard of living. Uh, there's another expression we'll use called real wages, which refers to the actual goods and services that a person can buy with his money wages. Unemployment exists because money wages, or as is often said, nominal wages, wages stated in the money, are excessive relative to the quantity of money and volume of spending. And that's why they're unsold goods, uh, because prices are uh, out of line, or they are excessive relative to the quantity of money and ability to spend for goods. All right, so this is the basic principle of why there is unemployment. And it explains also how there could be a labor shortage. And we've had labor shortages uh, occasionally, much less frequently than unemployment. But uh, we had a severe labor shortage in World War II. And I'll uh, explain that before I finish today. Well, if this is the principle, if the principle is correct, then uh, it also should be pretty clear uh, what precipitates unemployment. How do we suddenly get into unemployment? Well, one way would be if uh, wages start getting jacked up, if wages start getting jacked up and the demand for labor is constant or the demand for labor is growing less rapidly. Let's suppose we have a given fixed total demand for labor and we start out, we have full employment. We've got a million dollars in total payrolls and a thousand workers employed at an average annual wage of a thousand dollars. And now the workers insist on a five percent raise. They each, they want an average of a thousand fifty. Well, can total payrolls of a million employ a thousand workers at a thousand fifty? It's just mathematically not possible. This will create uh, roughly five percent unemployment. And if the process were to be repeated again the next year, if the, uh, let, let's say there's a union of these workers, which would be the obvious way that this could happen. If there were a union of these workers and they were asking for uh, repeated increases, each year they would add to the unemployment rate. And gradually you could build up a high unemployment rate. Well, that is one way that unemployment develops through jacking up wage rates, the, the precipitating cause is on the side of the rise in wage rates. Wages start rising and they rise relative to the demand for labor. That shrinks the number of job opportunities and that causes unemployment. The other way, which is when it happens, much more dramatic, is through a collapse in the demand for labor. If suddenly the demand for labor starts plunging and wage rates are staying where they were before that collapse or they're falling just moderately, well then you'll have mass unemployment. That's what happens in a depression. If we started out a million in payrolls, an average wage of a thousand and a thousand workers employed, and now something happens 
So the total payrolls have to fall to 750,000 and the average wage stays at 1,000, well then we've got 25% unemployment. Well, in a depression, uh, the mass unemployment is precipitated by a sudden contraction in spending. There's suddenly less spending for labor and less spending for goods. Now, that unemployment could be eliminated. We could get back to full employment. What would be required would then be a fall in wages and prices. Now, I'm going to uh, spend a lot of time on that, but I want to say a few words uh, to indicate, in essence, how a sudden contraction in spending occurs. I don't want to, uh, I, I think we can observe that it happens, but I'd like to try to give some explanation of what causes the sudden contraction in spending. In other words, what causes this essential feature of a depression. And I would say the explanation lies in a preceding artificial expansion in spending. Before every depression, there is an artificial inflationary boom of one kind or another. And the reason for the subsequent uh, sudden contraction in spending is first an artificial elevation of spending. Now, uh, I think I, I can give you an outline of the way the process works. On page one, I refer to uh, the relationship between the quantity of money and the volume of spending. I say money, the quantity of money times the velocity of circulation is equal to spending, demand. Now, just to give you an idea of how this works, naturally the erasers are over here. <laughs> All right, let's uh, spell this out. We have money, velocity, spending, and I'm introducing another heading, debt. All right, let us suppose we begin, we have a quantity of money which we'll call 100. You can think of it as 100 billion dollars. And we begin with a low velocity of circulation, three. People are holding money, they, like, they have confidence in the money, they think it's desirable to own money. If you pick up the balance sheet of the typical corporation, it'll show that a, a holding of money, cash or a checking account, is substantial relative to the short-term debts, the current liabilities of the corporation. And people are uh, glad to have substantial uh, liquid assets. All right, total spending uh, would be 300. And let us say, in this environment, uh, total debt in the economic system is 200. People are receiving the spending, of course. One man's spending is another man's revenue or income. So we've got total revenue or income. That's uh, the same as spending. That's 300, and debt is not a very great problem. Debt is 200, uh, no great difficulty. Now, if uh, we start expanding the quantity of money, most especially if the expansion in the quantity of money takes place in the form that von Mises calls credit expansion, meaning if money is newly created and that money is lent out, if we're creating new and additional money and the way it enters the economy is in the form of loans, this type of creation of money will uh, operate uh, in, a, in a very powerful way, I believe, to raise velocity of circulation. Now, let us say over a period of a few years, uh, let's say five years, ten years, perhaps ten years, let's say in a ten-year period, the quantity of money increases from 100 to 150. And much of this increase reflects the manufacture of money which is lent out. It's not newly mined gold, 
There may be some of it which is newly mined gold, but a very substantial portion of it is newly created money which is lent out. Well, suppose you are a businessman and here you are, the banks are able to create new and additional funds which they can lend. Well, that will create the impression that credit is easily and profitably obtainable. There'll be extra credit available. Interest rates will be low relative to the rate of profit. It will be profitable to borrow, especially profitable to borrow. Well, if you have the conviction that as and when you require funds, you can obtain them easily and profitably by borrowing, what does that do to your need actually to hold funds? You don't need to hold as much. You can become less liquid. Why hold, uh, why hold a checking account equal to 40% of your current liabilities when if you need money to pay bills or make purchases, you can readily borrow. So invest that money. Well, when business firms or when people in general decide that they don't need to hold as much money, they will spend it. The money is somewhere. It doesn't leave the economic system. Someone will always have it, but what happens is that money is spent more rapidly. We have a rise in velocity. So let us say that velocity goes to four. Well, total spending is now 600. And to compound it, the uh, creation of new and additional money entering the loan market, that operates to keep the rate of interest down. It doesn't mean that the rate of interest uh, will be low, lower than it was uh, before any of this started. Uh, it might work this way. Let's say if there was no credit expansion, the rate of interest would be 3% the rate of profit that you could earn when you borrowed would be 4%. Now we have credit expansion and the rate of profit for reasons that we'll see uh, hopefully before the end of these two weeks. Let's say the rate of profit goes from 4% to 7%. And the rate of interest will end up rising from 3% to 4%. Well, even though the rate of interest is higher than it used to be, 4% versus 3%, Relative to the rate of profit, it's much lower. It's 4% versus 7% instead of 3% versus 4%. Well, credit expansion operates to make it profitable to borrow, to incur a lot of debt, to become highly leveraged, as the expression goes, the, to, to increase the ratio of what you owe to the assets you control. All right, so let us say, to illustrate this idea, that debt perhaps goes to 700. Well now, what's going to happen if the process of credit expansion has to come to an end? People are going to be stuck with an inability to pay debts. Velocity, the, the, the height of the velocity of circulation, the ability the belief that you can operate safely with low cash holdings is predicated on the continuation and perhaps on the acceleration of credit expansion. If that stops, velocity should return to its original level of three. Now, if that were all that happened, if the quantity of money could remain stable at 150, we'd still have a serious problem. We'd have a sharp contraction in spending those people who thought they didn't need to hold money because they could easily and profitably borrow it, well, when that comes to an end, when the banks say, well, no, we haven't got the money to lend, sorry, well, then those who haven't held adequate cash because they thought they could borrow it, now they'd better build up their cash holdings. That will create the contraction in spending. But now if we've got this reduction in spending, how, are, how is this magnitude of debt going to be payable? We've got a magnitude of debt built up on a foundation of spending which can't be maintained. Well, then you get some serious bankruptcies and insolvencies. And what compounds the process is the uh, nature of the monetary system that we've always had uh, in this country and in uh, all other countries too, 
in modern times, even when we had the gold standard. And now I'm going to show you how the quantity of money can actually be reduced. Take this as a kind of miniaturized balance sheet of the banking system. We have assets and we have liabilities. All right, the banks have as an asset some actual money. Uh, the most obvious uh, form of actual money is the currency, the green stuff that we all carry around. And the banks have a substantial amount of that and that's an asset. Uh, on a gold standard, they would have actual gold. So uh, one major asset is, I'm going to call this standard money, standard money. On a gold standard, the standard money is gold. Standard money is that money which, when you are paid it, represents full and final payment. It's not a claim to anything. It's not redeemable. When you get it, that's it. You've got the money. On a gold standard, gold coin and gold bullion is the final means of payment. If you're owed something and you get gold, you can't say, well, I want to go redeem the gold. The gold is not redeemable. It represents full and final payment. Today, our standard money uh, is these little bits of green paper. They used to have the fiction, uh, it would say, pay bearer on demand, $5 or whatever. At one time, the paper money was a claim to gold or silver. The gold or the silver was the standard money. The paper money was a claim. Well, now the paper money is irredeemable. It is the standard money. All right, well, the banks have standard money. They have currency. They have actual currency. And another way, another form of the standard money that they have, uh, the banks have checking deposits with the Federal Reserve System. In Canada, the Canadian banks have uh, checking accounts with the uh, Bank of Canada. In Britain, it's the Bank of England. The banks have checking deposits with the central bank, and we can treat that as fully equivalent to currency. That's the standard money. Now, the, the, for the rest, the banks have assets in the form of loans that they've made to people and uh, securities that they've bought. They may buy municipal bonds. They uh, may buy commercial paper. Uh, so perhaps some corporate bonds, too. And then, of course, as a minor uh, trivial matter, they have the premises on which the bank is located and the bank building, but that's relatively small. The assets of the banks are standard money to some degree and, for the most part, loans that they've made and securities that they've purchased, which represent loans, too. Well, what are the liabilities of the banks? The liabilities are the deposits, the checking deposits, and they also have uh, time and savings deposits. This is the uh, money the banks owe. Now, what happens, what uh, precipitates an actual deflation, an actual reduction in the quantity of money, is first we go through a boom period. There's an expansion in the quantity of money, a rise in velocity of circulation, an encouragement to a volume of debt which can't be paid if spending drops. Well, what happens if the credit expansion comes to an end or substantially slows, velocity starts to drop, people have debts that they can't pay. Well, what if some of the business firms which can't pay their debts owe money to banks? What will happen to the value of the assets of the banks? That will drop. There will be a fall in the value of the assets of the banks. And now, if this is serious, what happens to the ability of the bank 
to honor its deposits. It goes down. They may not be able to. Well, then what do depositors want to do? Withdraw their money. You have a run. Now, how can the banks meet the withdrawal? You see, here's the problem. The proportion of actual money that the banks have, and, and I want to focus on checking deposits. Let's put savings deposits to the side, savings and time deposits. The banks may have, in terms of standard money, something like 10 cents for every dollar of checking deposits. And the other 90 cents represents loans and investments they've made. If you have a checking deposit, let's say at Bank of America, and you ask, well, what are the assets behind my checking deposit? Well, it may be 10 cents in currency or the equivalent of currency, and 90 cents in the form of loans that Bank of America has made. Now, suppose 10 or 15 cents of those loans go bad. Suppose some of those loans are uh, for mortgages, where people have uh, expected they'd uh, be able to sell houses at a good profit, and they can't, and now they can't meet the payments. Some more of the loans have been to Argentina or Poland or so on. Well, if that's the case, then what is the relationship between the assets and the checking deposit liabilities? There's a deficiency. Now, if uh, the government were not around to create as much new and additional standard money as required to meet all withdrawals, then uh, you'd have a run on lots of banks. We've, we've had the, uh, enough indication of the process. We've already had a couple of runs, uh, Continental Illinois, uh, the leading instance. But now, what happens when it becomes clear that a bank can't redeem its checking deposits? The bank will fail, but now what I'm taking for granted, which I perhaps shouldn't take for granted, is the knowledge that checking deposits are a major portion of the money supply. Most of the actual spendable money that we have is not the currency in our pockets. If you think of most of the payments that you make, especially if you're in business, most of the actual payments that are made in a country like the United States are in the form of check writing. Well, suppose it's uh, Friday evening, uh, you, go to sleep, uh, you go home, and you're confident uh, you've got uh, such and such checking deposit in a bank. And then Monday morning, we learn that this bank has closed its doors. Well, it used to be that your checking deposit was part of the quantity of money, and you could make purchases and pay bills. But now, your checking deposit is a doubtful claim, which may or may not ever be repaid. The assets of the bank uh, can't meet it. Well, what will happen to the usability of your checking deposit as money? It, it ceases to be money. It's closer now to a czarist bond than to money. Well, in this way, the quantity of money actually gets reduced. And now, if the quantity of money is actually reduced, what happens to the ability to spend money? That will drop. And what happens to the ability to repay debt? That will drop. Then there are more failures, more bankruptcies, more banks. Well, this is the essence of 1929 to 1933. When the credit expansion of the 20s came to an end, it came to an end at a point at which uh, velocity of circulation was at an unsustainably high level, given the end of credit expansion. So that had to produce some contraction in spending. That created uh, an impetus of insolvencies and bankruptcies. That took some banks with it. As those banks went, the actual quantity of money fell. As the quantity of money fell, the volume of spending fell further. The ability to repay debt was more difficult. There were more business failures, more bank failures. The process uh, could have gone on, was on the verge of going on uh, in 1933, to the point where all of the banks in the whole country uh, practically would have been bankrupt, the total quantity of money uh, would have been reduced uh, much more closely to the quantity of standard money. You see, our money supply can be conceived of as in two parts. 
there's the standard money, and then there are the claims to standard money, like checking deposits, but for which no standard money actually exists. There are the claims to standard money which are accepted as the equivalent of standard money, but for which no standard money actually exists. And when some bankruptcies and insolvencies develop, then the difference becomes clear. You have claims to standard money, checking deposits, which used to circulate as the equivalent of standard money, which used to support spending and revenue and ability to repay debt, and they lose all that. Now, von Mises uh, gives a technical name to these transferable claims to standard money, accepted in commerce as the equivalent of standard money, but for which no standard money actually exists. He calls these fiduciary media, fiduciary media. And it's the creation of these fiduciary media that sets the stage for a financial contraction and deflation. It's because first we have the creation of fiduciary media uh, leading to a more rapid rate of spending which can only be sustained if the process goes on and on and probably only if it accelerates. And whenever the process stops or slows down, well then velocity starts to drop, there are insolvencies and bankruptcies, and the quantity of money actually gets reduced. Well, here, this is how the sudden reduction in spending comes about. And this is what precipitates mass unemployment. When mass unemployment develops, it's not because the consumers don't want more goods. It's not because we've run out of things to produce. It's not because of machinery. It's not because of foreign competition or anything of this kind. The cause of mass unemployment in a depression is strictly monetary. It's strictly because of the nature of the kind of monetary system we've had, which has made possible artificial expansions in money, artificial boosts in spending, which are then uh, followed by contractions. Well, now, if uh, we get into that position, which again and again in our history we did, every few years this process would happen, we can still get back to full employment and full production. But what is required? We have to have the freedom for wages and prices to fall. Now, on page 10, uh, I present these uh, formulas once again for wages and prices, and I assume that we are in a state, we, we, we're starting in the midst of mass unemployment. We have, let us say, 25% unemployment. That's a very profound depression. The volume of spending for goods and labor, I'm assuming, has already fallen 25%. We've got 25% unemployment. We might imagine uh, total spending to buy consumer goods used to be a thousand, a trillion dollars. Now it's fallen to 750 billion. Uh, total spending to pay wages used to be 800 billion, now it's 600 billion. All right, the question is, here we are at a lower level of spending. We're, we no longer have the high levels of the previous boom. We're down to a lower level, commensurate with a smaller quantity of money and a lower velocity of circulation. What do we need to get back to full employment and full production? A reduction in prices and wages. A reduction in prices and wages. If spending for goods has fallen from 1,000 to 750, can't 750 buy fully as much or even more than 1,000 used to buy? All that would re be required is sufficiently lower prices. And the 600 of uh, wage payments could employ all the workers that 800 used to employ and more if money wages fell sufficiently. Well, the, uh, principle, the, the re what's required for restoration of full employment and full production if we're unfortunate enough to have the kind of monetary system that precipitates depressions, what's required for the restoration of full employment is 
the ability of wages and prices to fall. Now let me point out that um, the fall in wages required to eliminate unemployment should definitely and positively not be confused with a fall in the standard of living of the average worker because part of the same process is a fall in prices. Let's suppose uh, we have a certain volume of payroll spending. It stabilizes at the lower level of $600 billion. Now, at this moment, $600 billion is employing only three workers in four. If wages fell one-fourth, if we had three-fourths the wages, $600 billion could employ everybody. $600 billion could employ fully as many people as used to be employed by $800 billion. Well, the factory buildings are there. They, were already, they, they didn't go out of existence in the Depression. The machines are there. If we step up employment by, in the ratio of four people working where three were working, what, roughly speaking, should we expect to happen to production? Production ought to go up in the, on the order of four to three. Well now, if we have 800 billion being, or 750 billion being spent to buy the product, that's stabilized. We have a lower but stable level of spending to buy the product, and the product is now four-thirds the size. What roughly should happen to prices? Prices should be three-fourths. If the employment of four workers instead of three takes place, and they have roughly the same output per worker, we should have production in the ratio of four to three. If the spending to buy the product is stable at a lower level, well, prices should be three to four, just as wages. Well, if your wages fall one-fourth and prices fall one-fourth, what's implied about your actual buying power? It's the same. Real wages haven't fallen. Money wages have fallen, nominal wages. But real wages, which, rep, which refer to the goods and services you can actually buy with the money you earn, real wages haven't fallen. As a matter of fact, if anything, the elimination of unemployment has to raise real wages. Because when we have unemployment, who is supporting the unemployed? The people who are employed. Now, Look at it this way. Suppose we had a desert island with four people, and one of them isn't working, the other three are. All right, those three are supporting the one that isn't working. Now, if that one comes back to work, and we have four workers working instead of three, the three have to be better off, because now they can keep the output, which they used to give to the fourth, they can keep it for themselves. So they have to be better off. Well, in a monetary economy, exactly the same principle applies, only it can be accompanied by, is accompanied by, a fall in the money that is earned. You see, there's a serious problem. People confuse money with wealth. And as soon as you so show to someone, well, you might earn less money, their knee-jerk reaction is to assume that that means their standard of living is lower. It is not that way. If we eliminate unemployment through a fall in wages and prices, at the same time, the burden of supporting the unemployed is eliminated. So your wage, that you, the wage that you earn may be 25% less, but if the prices that you pay are 25% less, well, already you're, you're no worse off, but on top of that, you're not supporting the unemployed. The way to concretize this is, imagine in the Depression, you were earning $100 a week before wages and prices fell. But of the $100 a week that you were earning, $10 was being turned over to support the unemployed, either in charity or through taxes. So all that you actually had left was $90. Now, the fall in wages refers to the $100 that you're making before you're supporting the unemployed. Now, instead of earning $100, you'll earn $75. But you no longer have to subtract that $10. Your take-home pay doesn't fall $100 to $75. Your take-home pay falls $90 to $75. But what happens to prices? 
the prices fall in the, on the order of 100 to 75. You're in the position of you're buying at prices three-fourths, but your take-home wages haven't fallen three-fourths. Your gross pre-take-home wage fell one-fourth, I'm sorry, one-fourth, but your take-home wage uh, falls by less because you no longer have to pay the $10 to support the unemployed. It falls from 90 to 75, while the prices that you pay fall in the ratio of 100 to 75. So you're actually better off. And in principle, it must be this way because those who support the unemployed are those who are employed and if that is eliminated, they can keep more for themselves, even though everything goes on at a lower level of money. Now, there can be an important complication. If you go home and you pick up, uh, let's say, von Mises' Planning for Freedom, or some of his other essays, uh, he will often say that a condition of full employment is a reduction, not just in nominal wages, but in real wages. He argues, and most other economists uh, uh, on the free market side argue, that what's required is not just a fall in nominal, but a fall in real wages. Now, I think the only sense in which that could be true would be if we take our starting point in the middle. If, first, prices fall, if prices fall before wages, which might happen in a depression, if, first, prices fall and business profits are wiped out, you might ask, well, how could this occur? Well, in a depression, the, un the unemployment that occurs is concentrated most heavily in construction and the production of machinery. The unemployment is concentrated much more heavily in the production of expensive capital goods than it is in the production of consumer goods and the materials and components that quickly enter consumer goods. Well, in a depression, the production of consumer goods is not curtailed all that much. The spending for consumer goods falls very substantially. You can have the prices of consumer goods dropping without wages dropping, or dropping a lot further. And it's all at the expense of less production of capital goods. Well, starting from that situation, in that situation, those workers who are lucky enough to keep their jobs, they may have a temporary bonanza financed at the expense of the failure to produce capital goods, the failure to replace capital goods. And in that situation, business profitability is wiped out. And if we take that as our starting point, if we start in the middle where prices have fallen and wages haven't yet fallen, well, from that point, it will be necessary for wages to fall more than prices. So uh, starting in the middle that way, you could say there has to be some fall in real wages. But there need not be any fall uh, in real wages as compared with the period before the Depression. And if we allow for the problem of supporting the unemployed, it's difficult to see really how uh, there is even any short-run fall in real wages. All right, well, let us consider what is required for wages and prices to fall. What uh, further preconditions are necessary? Well, I would say uh, just two. The freedom of individuals to pursue their self-interests and uh, as a, 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 a corollary of that, it's subsumed under that heading, the freedom of competition. If we have unemployment because of the nature of the monetary system, well, if individuals are left free to pursue their self-interests, that pursuit will automatically operate to drive down wages and prices to the point of achieving full employment. Because if we have unemployed workers, what does their self-interest consist of? What will they be willing to do in order to get jobs? They'll bid down wages. They'll be willing to work for less than the workers who are already working. 
And if employers are following their self-interest, they will say to their present employees, well, look, I can replace you with other workers equally good who will work for less. And if you want to keep your jobs, you have to meet their competition. You have to accept a cut. Well, this is how wages are reduced. The competition of the unemployed following their self-interest and employers following their self-interest, that drives down wages. But it's not a competition for a given number of jobs. As nominal wages fall, the ability of the existing payroll funds to employ labor is enlarged. The lower wages make it possible for the same payroll funds to employ more people. So what may appear to be a competition for a given number of jobs has the effect of expanding the number of jobs and does so to the point of full employment. Now, what stops this process? Why don't we uh, very quickly get back to full employment whenever something happens which uh, pushes us away from it? Well, the answer is government intervention which stops people from pursuing their self-interests and from freely competing. Uh, the leading types that we can observe today uh, are, start, first of all, minimum wage laws. If there's a minimum wage law, it is simply flatly illegal to have wages fall for broad categories of workers to the point where they could be employed. It's just against the law. Now, uh, we have laws which give special powers to labor unions. Uh, labor unions are able to act virtually as private governments. They're able to resort to force and intimidation, and generally they get away with it. When you have mass picketing, and you've all seen newsreels of gangs of very burly individuals who work out by lifting cars. <laughs> <laughs> well, <clears throat> that's intimidation, and that's preventing the competition of other workers. Uh, routinely in a Teamsters strike, there are uh, trucks which are shot at. And uh, since 1932, uh, with the passage of the Norris LaGuardia Act, it's been impossible, uh, except in uh, very, very extreme cases, to get federal court injunctions against this sort of activity. And uh, the uh, National Labor Relations Act, uh, the Wagner Act, and uh, before that, uh, the National Industrial Recovery Act uh, requires that employers, quote, bargain, unquote, uh, with duly established uh, unions in their uh, plants or shops. Anytime a majority of workers in an establishment decides they want to be represented by a union, the employer is compelled to deal with them. And the unions are, in this way, enabled uh, to impose the rates of pay uh, that they wish to have. And the unions have influence far beyond the industries in which the, uh, they are directly organized. In non-union establishments, if it's easy for a union to be established, employers in non-union establishments will generally have to follow the union pay scales so that his workers will not decide to unionize. In which case, not only would he have the union pay scales, but lose uh, all of the management prerogatives and uh, the ability to improve efficiency. So legislation which allows labor unions to resort to intimidation or which compels employers to deal with them enables unions to impose uh, wage levels which are above the market. You must meet the union scale or you won't be able to operate uh, in most cases, or it has been that way at least until very recently. Beyond that, uh, further measures, if it's possible for workers to obtain uh, unemployment insurance or welfare allowances, which are not that much below what they can make after taxes and uh, transportation costs when they work, well, that's a powerful inducement not to work. Now, in the very early 30s, uh, we did not have, at that time, uh, we didn't have a, a federal minimum wage law. That didn't come until 1938. And the labor unions 
uh, by the end of the 20s were powerful only in construction and railroading. Nevertheless, uh, there was major government intervention starting under President Hoover in support of maintaining wage rates. Uh, in 1930 and 1931, President Hoover held uh, conferences at the White House uh, in which the uh, presidents and uh, chief executives of the leading corporations of the country participated, and in which they all agreed not to take advantage of unemployment to reduce wages, or at least not to do so any further than prices had already fallen. Hoover's belief, which had become very popular uh, in the 1920s among businessmen, was that if wages fall, the ability of consumers to spend must fall, and that would uh, intensify the Depression. Well, that's a fallacy uh, in and of itself. It confuses the wages of an individual worker with total wages. If we have more people working at a lower average wage, that certainly doesn't mean less total spending. But that was the belief that uh, became dominant in the 20s. And so Hoover was very proud of the fact that his administration, for the first time in American history, was taking steps to uh, stop the Depression from running its course and was deliberately holding up wages. And if you look at the record, you'll find that uh, in 1929, or rather in 1930, uh, average money wages fell less than 3% and less than 7% in 1931. And uh, finally, in 32, they fell 14%. But this was a much slower process. For example, in the previous depression that we had had in 1920-21, in a period of a year, nominal wages fell 19%, and the depression was over in just about a year, and we were back to full employment. Well, the uh, the, the preventing of wages from falling actually worked to uh, greatly intensify and deepen the Depression. Because if we have uh, the end of credit expansion and there is a reduction in spending, it is necessary that business henceforward be done at a lower level of wages and prices. There has to be a fall in wages and prices given the end of credit expansion in order to have full employment. But suppose that fall in wages is not yet forthcoming. It's being stopped. The government is stopping it. Well, here you are. You're a businessman. You are contemplating the construction of a new factory or the purchase of equipment. But wages and the cost of construction or the price of that new equipment has not yet fallen. Only you think the market situation requires some substantial fall. Well, how will that affect your behavior? You'll wait. You'll say, well, in a year from now or 18 months or whatever, I can build this factory a lot cheaper than I can do it now. Well, the consequence of the failure of nominal wages to fall was a radical postponement in investment spending and investment spending in the early 30s uh, practically disappeared. Well, that drying up of investment spending meant less sales revenues to firms throughout the economy, less sales revenues to the makers of equipment and construction materials, less sales revenues to the sellers of the consumer goods those workers involved would have bought. <clears throat> And so what did that do to their ability to repay debt? It reduced it. it reduced it, causing further business failures, further bank failures, a further reduction in the quantity of money, which otherwise wouldn't have been necessary, requiring that the ultimate equilibrium of wages be lower than it otherwise would have been. Had there been a fast, sharp drop, it would not have had to go as far as it ultimately would have had to go because of the continued decline in the quantity of money. So the policy of interfering with the fall in wages uh, intensified uh, the Depression. 
Now, uh, from 1929 to 1933, the quantity of money in the United States actually fell by about one-third. The money supply was around 26 billion in 1929. It was down to about 19 billion in 1933, reflecting the failure of all those banks, the loss of their checking deposits as part of the money supply. From 1933 on, the uh, government adopted a deliberate policy of inflating the money supply. Uh, and the quantity of money uh, between 1933 and 1939 increased from 19 billion to 36 billion. But mass unemployment persisted because at the same time the uh, unions were growing in power. They were entering major new industries that they hadn't been in before. And from 1933 on, even in the midst of mass unemployment, Instead of wages falling at all anymore, they actually started rising from 1933 on, in the midst of the Depression, in the midst of the mass unemployment. And this prevented the growth in the quantity of money and volume of spending from achieving full employment. There was uh, some reduction in unemployment, but much of the reduction in unemployment that occurred was of an artificial make-work nature. It was, uh, Unemployment was reduced by means of employing uh, large numbers of people in the Civilian Conservation Corps, in the, public, uh, in the Works Projects Administration. So much of the unemployment that uh, was eliminated was actually eliminated in a way that uh, represented no genuine economic improvement which in fact operated to lower the standard of living of that part of the population which was employed. Now, you see, the uh, Keynesians and the uh, New Dealers and liberals, their idea is uh, anything which eliminates unemployment is just fine. They say, well look, if we have 10 million people out of work, Let's at least put them to work uh, on useful government projects, on some kind of government project. Isn't that better than nothing? Well, in fact, employment for the government, and we'll see the same principle will apply to employment in a war, employment for the government represents an economic loss to the rest of the population. To illustrate this idea, Imagine that the people in the first row here were all unemployed. And I'm the government. And I can think of uses for their labor. I'd like them to come and work for me. Well, suppose we do that. They're going to, they're going to produce something that I want. Let's say they'll build some nice looking courthouses. They'll build some roads on which there are not very many people uh, traveling. They'll do something. We'll, we'll get something out of them. All right. But meanwhile, these people, in working, they have to uh, have food and clothing, and certainly significantly more than when they were out of work. And they need uh, equipment and materials and so forth. And physically, where will they obtain them from? If this group represents the whole economy, what is the source of the food, clothing, appliances, whatever, that these people will get, the materials and equipment that they will use, where will that come from? From all of you in the back. All right, well now observe, their output is coming to me for my purposes, and it is of little or no value to you. Your output, to some significant degree, is going to them. Well, what's your reward? No, what, is the ec what is the economic impact of their employment, of their being employed, on your standard of living? You have a lower standard of living. I'm employing them, that's great, they're employed, and I'm sending the bill to you. And you get nothing. Well, that is the nature of government make-work employment. And uh, much or most of the extra employment that was achieved under the New Deal was of that nature. It actually represented an economic loss to the rest of the economy. Relatively little headway 
was made against the, the real unemployment problem. The increase in money and spending did uh, not have the ability to substantially eliminate the unemployment problem because at the very same time wages and prices were going up due to the expansion in union power. Now, how did we finally get out of the unemployment? Most people say, well, somehow World War II did it. And the usual implication is, well, finally we had enough new and additional needs for work that uh, we can have full employment. Well, that is not how it happened at all. We had all the needs we ever needed. Needs are the cheapest thing. The last thing we need is more needs. <laughs> the way unemployment was eliminated in World War II was by a combination of massive inflation, massive money creation on the one side. The government uh, stepped up its spending for the war uh, by a huge increment. And a, a major chunk of the war was paid for by the creation of new and additional money. The quantity of money between 1939 and 1945 almost tripled. Uh, there was a huge creation of money. The federal budget ballooned. They raised taxes very sharply, but uh, we had enormous budget deficits. And the deficits were financed uh, very heavily by the creation of new and additional money. Now, that alone would not have been sufficient. The unions could easily have taken advantage of that situation and started saying, well, start raising our wages 10, 15, 20 percent a year. And we could have had mass unemployment and rapidly rising prices at the same time, as has turned out to be a later experience. But in the war, there was a further measure adopted, which was wage and price controls. Now, I'm certainly the last person in the world to advocate that, and I'm not advocating that. But I want you to understand that that combination is what permitted full employment. Because now, if you have the rise in spending for labor, but wages are prohibited by law, from keeping pace with the rise in spending, well, then what happens to the number of workers who can be employed? They're rapidly increased, and then you even reach a labor shortage. In World War II, within a very short time, we went from a situation of mass unemployment to a labor shortage where President Roosevelt, in his uh, State of the Union Address of 1944, was proposing forced labor because of a labor shortage. Uh, people didn't have the motivation to work when there were shortages of consumer goods. They had all the money they wanted. They couldn't spend the money they had. Why work? Well, that was the situation we got into. What made that possible was a rapid rise in payrolls. It's as though here we are. We started. We had uh, 750 workers working with payrolls of 750,000. And now we jack up the payrolls from 750,000 to 2 million, and the law allows wages to rise only from uh, 1,000 to 1,200. Well, you would have a very severe labor shortage. There was no miracle about the achievement of full employment. It was achieved because in the war, nominal wages and prices were put in a much lower relationship to spending and the quantity of money. Now, we could have had full employment without the war if wages and prices fell relative to the quantity of money. The, the war was absolutely unnecessary as a means of having full employment. And in fact, even though we had full employment in the war, Looking at it from a purely economic point of view, the war was a disaster. There was full employment, and as a consequence of the war, the average standard of living fell to a point far below where it had been in the worst years of the Depression. The war was by no means a period of prosperity, as we're usually told. Just consider. In the war, 
the production of new private passenger automobiles was simply prohibited. All of the factories were converted to producing tanks and jeeps. The production of all new major private appliances was prohibited. There was no new private housing construction. There were shortages of such common everyday goods as gasoline, tires, red meat, even uh, chocolate bars, nylon stockings, whatever. Now, in the war, everybody was working, and those who were working were working longer and harder, but they were getting vastly less for their work because roughly half the output of the economic system was in the form of planes, tanks, artillery shells, etc., which was of no economic benefit to the producers. So, to go back to the example of uh, the, the Make Work projects, imagine that we take half of this group and the people in the first six rows are going to be producing tanks, planes, etc. You guys in the back have to produce the goods that they require for their ordinary lives. Well, how will we all stand? The output of half the class is being chewed up on the, ba uh, on the battlefields. Everyone is working round the clock, but what are you getting for it? Where is the prosperity in that? That is a period of profound impoverishment. Why did people believe it represented prosperity? Well, for two reasons. Everybody was making more money than he had ever made. Why was everyone able to make more money? Because the government created a lot of money. They tripled the money supply in, three, in five years. So everyone made more money. Now, the very fact that wages and prices were controlled and shortages existed made it the easiest thing in the world for any businessman to sell his goods or for any worker to be employed. Just think, uh, think to your own experience in the gas, uh, gasoline shortage. Let's say there was a gas station, which you passed many times, but you didn't quite feel comfortable going in there. It just looked pretty seedy, and you didn't want that stuff in your tank. <clears throat> All right. <laughs> now, there's the gasoline shortage. What happens to your scruples? <laughs> All right. That guy will, will sell all the gas he's got. Well, when you create a shortage, you make it possible for businessmen to sell whatever they're producing hand over fist, who couldn't have sold anything when people were able to use normal standards of discrimination. And any worker who remotely looks like he can do the job will be snapped up. Well, now, if people think in very superficial terms, how much money am I making and how easy is it to make money, and they don't bother to think, what can I actually buy for the money I'm making, well, then it looks prosperous. But they actually weren't able to buy very much. They were making money, and a huge chunk of the money they were making, they were using to buy war bonds. Or it was piling up in savings accounts. They just couldn't spend the money. You were limited in what you could spend by the fact, A, a large category of goods just wasn't available. Many, many others were rationed. So uh, people were spending money in some ways. In World War II, uh, it was common to hear about $20 tips to nightclub waiters. That was uh, one of the few ways you could spend some money. But people weren't actually able to obtain real goods and services. Now, prosperity came only with the end of the war. From 1945 to 1946, the federal budget was slashed from $100 billion to $35 billion in one year. And all of the factories and plants that had been producing tanks and planes and so on, now they were able to start producing cars and washing machines, and we were able to start building new houses and so forth. And the uh, millions of soldiers who had just been uh, standing there getting fed and having uniforms and firing shells and so on, now they could come back and actually produce something. And that is the time from which we, have, we had full employment or something not too far from it and prosperity. The war, as I say, was a period of terrible impoverishment. It took the return to peace 
to have uh, full employment with prosperity. And we need never have had, we, we, we never needed a war for full employment. What we needed was an appropriate relationship between wages and prices on the one side and uh, the quantity of money and volume of spending on the other. Now, finally, as a last word, if what I've told you, if the principles are correct, uh, what is implied as the means of uh, preventing unemployment in the future? Well, there are two basic requirements. Uh, a total free labor market. The government should not intervene in any way, directly or indirectly, with the height of wage rates. There should be no minimum wage law, no laws uh, giving unions special legal privileges, no laws allowing them to resort to intimidation. There should be no indirect jawboning or, quote, moral suasion, unquote, which is really uh, blackmail uh, on the part of the government to get businessmen, in this case, to keep wages up. There should be absolutely none of that. And to avoid the uh, precipitous declines in spending, uh, the solution to that, in my judgment, although there are other people who uh, share uh, the same basic principles I do who have a different view, uh, I would say the solution to the problem of depressions would be to have a 100% reserve precious metal monetary system, which would mean the entire money supply, uh, currency, uh, checkbooks, the entire money supply either would be gold or silver coin or uh, claims to gold or silver coin payable on demand and 100% backed by gold or silver. In my judgment, if every unit of the money supply represented a definite physical unit of gold or silver, there would be modest, sustained growth in the money supply, not enough to raise prices, and not enough to lead people to hold uh, unduly low levels of money. P money would be something desirable and people would want to hold it. And once such money comes into existence, it never goes out of existence. If some debtor fails, that has no effect on the quantity of money. So in my judgment, we could have uh, a monetary system which would be immune both to inflation of any significance and certainly immune to deflation and we could have uh, continuous full employment. People, of course, would uh, often change their jobs. Sometimes they'd be unemployed as some industry declined and they looked elsewhere. But we need never have uh, a problem of a depression throughout the economic system or mass unemployment. That is strictly, uh, in my judgment, the result of uh, government interference. All right, well, uh, this is what I have to say for this morning. We have just about 10 minutes for questions. Hopefully, we'll have a longer question period uh, in the future. Yes. Thank you. Yes. I'm sorry, would you repeat that? Yes. Since M1 is by definition the addition of an asset to a liability, is it still a beneficial term to use? Is M1, you mean the M1 is the, uh, the money supply uh, uh, defined as currency plus checking deposits. All right, if M1 is... Uh, and I, All right, it is M1, since, part, since M1, to the extent it consists of checking deposits, is an asset of the depositors and a liability of the banks, is it a meaningful term to use in economics? I would say it's a meaningful term, very much so. Uh, it's, I would use, I, 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 would, I like the expression fiduciary media. But we want to be aware of what the money supply is. And the fact that uh, a major part of the money supply is simultaneously an asset and a liability and could be wiped out by the failure of banks 
Well, that's something very significant to keep in mind. It explains the potential for a deflation. Now, I have to add that I don't think that there is any likelihood today that there would be a deflation because unlike 1930 and 31 and so on, the government has unlimited power to create standard money. At that time, uh, the government could not simply say, well, if the banks need an extra five billion, we'll give it to them, because the money that the government could issue was limited by the gold it had to have. Now, there is no connection between the government's money and gold, so they can create whatever they want and uh, continuously bail out the banks. Gentleman right in the center. Yes, uh, could would you comment on the fundamental differences of, from a money supply standpoint between the Austrian view, which I assume is yours, and the, uh, the monetarist, the Friedman, and uh, the supply siders uh, perspective uh, right now? Okay, comment on the difference between uh, what you call the Austrian view, which more or less I propound, and uh, the views of Friedman and the monetarists and the so-called uh, supply-siders. All right, uh, Professor Friedman uh, advocates a system uh, in which the government controls the money supply but increases it at a very slow, steady rate. He's changed his mind on what that rate should be a few times, but the basic idea is the government would see to it that year in and year out the money supply increased at some definite rate. Well. A lot of the, his idea, I think, uh, has a, an awful lot in common with what would actually happen on a 100% reserve gold system. Uh, where I would differ from him is I don't believe that the government uh, should be in control of the money supply. Uh, I think to say today they will tell us they'll uh, increase it uh, 2 or 3%, well, that's fine, but if they have the power, there is nothing to stop them from uh, having a, a, a much more odious policy. You see, you could say, well, wouldn't it be nice to get the criminals off the street? And if we gave the police some extra powers, they might actually, for a while, uh, clean up the streets from the criminals. But I would hate to, I would never want to give them that power because while, so long as that's all they did, if that's all they did, it might work well, you could never assume that that's all they do. And if we have a system in which the government uh, is the one that determines the increase in the quantity of money, uh, that is no protection of any kind. That's potentially disastrous. Plus, uh, further problems are each government then has its own separate money. If we have a gold system, there is one money throughout the world, or can be. And the constraints on the government are an awful lot harder. You see, when I talk of a gold standard, I don't mean that uh, we simply have a law that says the government has to have a certain amount of gold. I talk of a gold standard in which actual gold money would be used in day-to-day -day life and people's basic idea of money would be gold. And that is a very powerful constraint on the government because the government, if it wants to create money in that environment, just can't do it. It can't manufacture gold. Now, a quick word on the supply-siders. The supply-siders, uh, they're called supply-siders in contrast to the Keynesians who thought all that you have to do is create money and that will boost demand. The supply-siders are concerned with uh, increasing production, but uh, they minimize the uh, the significance of the ability to create money. And in their view, the problem of inflation is not that the government has the power to create money, but that the government has stopped us from creating goods fast enough. They, in effect, uh, think we could have a system in which the government is free to create money, but by some magic, they'll enable us to run still faster and create enough goods so that the government's money creation won't have such terrible consequences. They want to avoid getting at the root of the uh, government's ability to create money. Just one more question, and then we'll have to stop for now. Uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Richman, would you distinguish between standard money, lawful money, and legal tender? When I distinguish between standard money, lawful money, and legal tender, well, uh, standard money uh, 
is that which, as I say, when you get it, represents full and final payment. Legal tender is money which you can be compelled to accept when what you have agreed to accept is something different. For example, we might make a contract, I will lend you 10 ounces of gold and next year you'll give me 11 ounces back. And if uh, most of us or many of us started to do that, that would become the standard money of the market. If the government says, you have the right to compel me to accept, instead of 11 ounces of gold, so much in paper, that's legal tender money. And I, I would oppose any form of legal tender money. Lawful money could be, or should be, I think, any money which the parties have contractually agreed to. Well, I'm afraid I just must stop now. And thank you very much.